Good morning, everybody. We welcome you to Sunday school this morning. Welcome, Facebook. Amen. It's just good to see everybody face to face. Boy, that'll preach. <laughs> Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you today. Lord, I want to thank you. I am humbled this morning that you put this lesson together by your hand strategically. You gave me the verbiage. And so, Lord, I am humbled today. I thank you that you walked with me in preparing for this lesson. Now, Holy Spirit, complete the work of this message. And we thank you for what you're doing in this very hour of this day. We thank you for penetrating the hearts of your people and doing what you do best. That no man can do what you do. What you can do in a moment, man cannot do in a lifetime. So, Lord, I give you all the praise this morning, the honor and the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> all right, so in this chapter today, we're going to cover two main areas. Uh, to know Jesus personally, before we're done, you are going to know what you need to know about knowing Jesus personally. And also, focusing on the goal, the prize, the, fine, the, the, the grand finale, if you will. I'm going to give you a little bit of a, of a bit of an appetizer, and we might call it an introduction. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and share some things with you. Um, Paul, once again, in this chapter, is going to bring a warning. Repetition is good. Say that with me. Repetition is good. He will share his testimony. It's a little bit different for Paul. Um, you're going to see some uh, the before, as we would say, B.C., before Christ, and after Christ. <clears throat> we're going to see striving, lots of striving. And then we're going to see the opposite of that, which is thriving. We're going to see that. Uh, we're also um, we're going to see Paul bring much hope to the body of Christ, to the Philippians, to you, to me, to the world today, those who read the Bible. Paul's legacy lives on today. He's still evangelizing the world. He also gives, um, gives all uh, Encouragement to focus, to focus in on heaven. He, again, he brings encouragement. In this chapter, we see a little different part of Paul. We see him cheering on. Not so much the warning, but the cheering on. He's like your biggest cheerleader. I am encouraged today with Paul. I have a new... Um, a freshness in my soul. My, my soul leaps today. It leaps. Um, and I hope that that's what will happen to your spirit as well. Let's get started. Um, in life, we all have experienced a time uh, where someone has asked you these questions. Do you know so-and-so? Have you ever met so-and-so? Right? We've all had those questions asked to us before. Our responses can be very, very different, and I'll give you some examples. You might say, yes, I know that person personally. I know them through a friend. I have heard of that person, but I have never met them. I met them, but I really haven't gotten to know them. No, I don't know that person. I've heard a lot of good things about that person. No, but I would like to meet them one day. Isn't that true? All of those could be responses. Any of these responses could be said from people about Jesus. 
the same exact response. Let me start off by saying Jesus knows every one of us, even before we know him. In fact, I'll go further. He actually knows us better and more than we know ourselves. Sometimes we think we know ourselves, but put to the test, squeezed, you'll really get to know who you are. Amen? Amen. No one, I want to I say this today, no one, This is key. No one could be nearer or more available to us than God the Father, His Son, and His Holy Spirit. You know, many people, when asked, do you know Jesus, oftentimes the answer is yes. Yes, I'm a Christian. Or yes, I know all about Jesus. This is why I prefer to ask the question this way. Who is Jesus personally to you? That's a different question. That's a different question. Ask this question or asked this way causes that person to ponder, causes that person to go deeper in their thoughts and to search their hearts and to go, whoa, that's a different question. Amen? Knowing about Jesus, who he is, and what he has done is called knowledge, head knowledge of Jesus. Knowing Jesus personally means I have, I have first-hand experience It means I have a relationship with him. Takes two for a relationship, right? Same for Jesus. It means I talk to him. He walks with me. He talks to me in all sorts of ways. You just have to listen closely and you'll hear him. It'll come in different ways. It'll come through his word. It may come through another person. It may come for me many times, a literal billboard on the side of the street. God will get his message, his word, what he's trying to speak to us. He'll get it to us. Amen. When we accepted Christ into our heart and our life, Jesus now takes residence in us. You mean physically? No, no. The spirit of the Lord resides in us. Jesus' disciples were afforded the opportunity to know Jesus face to face. What a privilege in that time. I often think of that, how that was. It blows my mind. But they had that opportunity where they not only um, had him after he left because the Spirit of the Lord Jesus said, I'll leave my spirit. Amen? But they also had him face to face. When Jesus ascended into heaven, he promised the disciples in John 14, 18, uh, that he will not leave them as orphans. Verse 19. And again, this is the introduction, so I don't want you to be thrown. Um, Verse 19. uh, They would see me, um, that they would, that the world won't see me anymore, but you will see me, my people, my people will see me because I live, because I, I live, you will also live. Verse 20, on that day, you will realize that I am in my father and you in me. And I am in you. Bam. There's the proof. Okay. This applies not just to the disciples. The word of God is for all of us. We can all 
experience the same thing. And in fact, we do. All of the word is for all of us. When we receive Jesus, again, he lives in us. He is with us. He is all around us. Oftentimes, I think about in my life, I was thinking about this last night. There have been many times that the presence of the Lord has been so real, so sweet, that I would be driving. I was, I was thinking about this last night. I'd be driving down the road, and I literally could feel his presence right there in the car with me or in my home, wherever, just wherever I am. And literally, I could feel his presence. Those people are precious times. They're precious. We don't always get to feel the presence like that. Sometimes it's by faith, amen, that he is with us. But I count it all joy when I do get to experience those times where I literally Feel his presence. And it's so real. 2 Timothy 4.22. The Lord Jesus Christ be with thy spirit. Grace be with you. As we get to know Jesus in our daily relationship and walk with him, he leads us, he guides us, he directs us, he teaches me how to live. He wants us to really know him. Not just about him, but to know him. Now let's move into the meat of the chapter. Let's remember, while Paul is writing this letter, he's where? He's still in prison. He's in prison. So, Philippians chapter 3, verse 1. Whatever happens, he really means that. He really means that. You'll see this as we move on. In another translation, um, it says, finally. Finally. Now, Paul's not saying, Paul's not ending his message like, like pastor would be preaching, and he says, okay, finally. That means you know, that's the cue, that he's about to end his message. That is not what Paul is doing here. He's transitioning. There's a shift happening. So he continues. Okay? So he says, whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice seems to be a theme. It seems to be a theme of his. It's repeated nine times in his letter. Why? Because it is his continued emphasis on the mindset, the attitude of the follower of Christ. Just wow. Just wow. He's in prison, right? A man imprisoned. For the sake of Christ is reminding me, a person that is free on the outside, to rejoice. Doesn't that blow your mind? It absolutely blows my mind. That's supernatural. But that's where Paul was. He lived in that realm. I have, let's move on. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Paul gives no apologies. He gives no apologies for repetition. He gives no apologies for the same exact instructions. He doesn't. I am certain that we can all relate to this. Um... Think about what you may have said in your own mind before, in the past, or maybe recently. I've heard this before. I already heard this already. 
Why are you repeating this? We already know this. Perhaps tell me something new. Have you ever don't raise your hand? <laughs> have you have you had these thoughts before? Tell me something new. Give me some new material, a new message, a fresh word, fresh rhema. Well, Paul recognized that's not what was needed, obviously, because he wouldn't be going there. Somebody or somebody's needed to hear this again. The Philippians could have thought this very same thing. Paul, we're tired of hearing you say this. Repetition is for our good. It helps us get the message and make right choices. Peter agrees with Paul in, in his method, in his way. 2 Peter 1, 13 through 15 says, Peter, um, he's reinforcing, he's doing the same thing. He says, I'm stirring you up. By the way of reminder, and after I am gone, just like Paul, after I am gone, you will be able to recall the things I have shared with you by way of instruction. Let us, let us resist the temptation to tag out when we hear something that we already heard, perhaps now, we will get it. Perhaps now we'll get it. Or, or maybe we'll, we'll gain a greater understanding or truth or a fresh revelation. Perhaps now our heart is ready to receive that same exact word that seemed to be familiar to us. Verse 2. Watch out for those ducks. Here we go. <laughs> the warning. Hang on, people. Watch out for those dogs. Those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. Dogs. False teachers. He is specifically talking about the Judah Judaizers, the Jews. These were a group of men who Paul would, let's just give you a short recap. Remember in Galatians when we studied, we talked about how um, Paul would go from church to church and he would preach the gospel. He would preach um, how one could be saved. As soon as he would leave, these groups, the Jews, men, it was a group of men, they would go into the church and they would begin to tell them, this is not the way. This is not the way. You have to be circumcised according to the law. So what they did was they brought in much confusion, much confusion. So he's reminding them about these dogs. He calls them dogs, false teachers. Let's move on. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. We. That's all of us. That's you and me. That's the Gentiles, the Jew. I think he purposely put that there. Kind of like a little dig. <laughs> all right? But it's so freeing to hear that. We, we all get to participate. That's all of us who are in Christ. In Christ. Paul clarifies that cutting away of the flesh physically Physical circumcision doesn't make me an heir of God, a citizen of God, a joint heir with Jesus. But spiritual circumcision, cutting away of the old man, dying from self, 
or better yet, dying, uh, denying self are actually the result of having faith in Christ and being in Christ, the Spirit of God being in Christ. It is what Christ did. And Paul comes to that point in his life where he, um, he understands that. And it is a turning point for Paul. Remember, if we are into legalism, then we will believe it's what I have to do. That would be my ticket to heaven. It's what I do. Wrong. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Verse 4. Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. Paul had all the proper Jewish credentials. We will see soon that Paul makes that point that nobody can truly be justified by anything other than faith even his own impressive, advanced, surpassing resume. Amen? But here, right here, he clearly defines his devotion and his relationship before Christ. The old Paul, the old man, he clearly defines, as I said, his devotion, his relationship to the law. To the law. Verse 5. I was circumcised when I was eight. And I'm going to read. I think I'm going to. No, let's just do it this way. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. Stop there. Um, What he's saying is, I was a Jewish boy from a Jewish home. I came from a godly family. That's number one. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Israel. What do you think about when you hear the word Israel? God's chosen people. Paul says, I'll go a step further. I'm a part of that. I'm chosen. I'm from God's chosen people. I am from the stock of Israel. So he talks about Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a member of the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin, remember, was a favored tribe. Remember in the tribe, Benjamin was blessed by Moses as the beloved of the Lord Rest secure in him, for he shields him, he he shields him all day long. That right there is favor. So Paul had membership. I belong to the tribe of Benjamin. He's building his resume. That status, people, that status. All right. He says, I'm a, re- I'm a Hebrew, if there ever was one. Exclamation point. He's saying, I'm 100% Hebrew. There's pride in that, right? It would be like if someone says, I'm a daddy today. They just had a baby, he and his wife. I'm a daddy today. There's great pride in that, Right? I was a member of the Pharisees who demanded the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. Birthright. He's a member of the Pharisees. He followed the law. He has bragging rights. He's got all these achievements, bragging rights, birthrights, all these kinds of rights. Because of his achievements. Remember, all these things were very, very important. They were priority to the Jew. All of these things. It makes for a great resume 
for a Jew. He checks off all the boxes on his list. I did this, I'm this, etc., etc. These were all Paul's treasure trophies. All of these things that he list. His before Christ, his BC before Christ credentials are both noteworthy and impeccable. If someone would have graded Paul, he'd have got an A plus 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 plus. He put in a lot of hard work, a lot of striving to get this on his resume. Paul had a religious past. He had a religious past, and we'll see that. He says, I was so zealous, verse 6, I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. Righteousness. He believed he was right. And that he was being, actually, that he believed that he was being a good Christian. Zeal. He had incredible passion that far extended any of them, them, the other people. There were no limits in Paul's life at this time. Actually, the sky was the limit. Verse 7, I once thought these things were valuable. Here, oh, a turning point. Turning point. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. He sees the truth. The Bible says if we know the truth, the truth will what? It'll set us free. And that's exactly what happens to Paul right here. He is now in Christ. Everything changes. Everything. There's a complete turnaround. No more confidence in his flesh or his accomplishments or all of his accolades. Instead, it's now in Jesus. Jesus is his everything. He realizes coming to Christ, being in Christ, that we uh, can't earn our way to Christ, our personal efforts no longer matter. It has no meaning and it has no weight. It won't get me to where I'm trying to go. In other words, a motive. His heart and his understanding has shifted. The fruit, it's what Christ has done in me and for me. We, you and I, must be careful not to fall into the enemy's traps, even religious traps, as Paul did. As Paul did. Um, if This is key. If what I can do becomes a substitute of the lordship of Christ, then I am on the wrong path. I'm on the wrong path. We need to pay attention. Verse 8. Yes, everything else is worthless when I compared with when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have discarded everything else, Christ, and become one of him with him, I'm sorry. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right, key, with himself depends on faith. Paul now loses what once was all of his assets. He had him in this column. All of his assets... And his gain now becomes life and eternal life. He's no longer striving, but thriving.
He now has a personal relationship with Christ. Paul experiences death. He experiences a death. A literal, not a physical death here. It's not time for him to go. But it's a spiritual death. Um, In marriage, there may be times of struggle, uh, issues. When that's happening, there is a time where the husband and the wife comes together. They work together. They might even compromise. Some healing has to take place. Would you agree? Yeah. To move forward. Financial difficulties. Sometimes when when we are in that season of financial difficulties, we have to pull back. Maybe a little, maybe a lot. Relationship challenges. There may be seasons of where we might need to alter something in, in, in our relationships. Perhaps some changes will come. Perhaps new boundaries are set, right? Where are you going with this, Donna? Just pay attention. (laughs) When we get to a place where we surrender our lives to Christ and salvation takes place, it's an incredible moment in a person's life. But when in the natural you, you perhaps go to a doctor, and you receive a bad report. You receive a bad report. And that report could go like this. I'm sorry to, to tell you this, but um, we found something. We found something, and um, it's really bad. It's really bad. And we think that um, you might have a year to live. You may have one year to live based on our findings. I can tell you for fact, for certainty, that when, if and when that ever happens to you, God forbid. But if it does, everything in your life changes. Everything What once was a priority, number one, is no longer a priority. Number two, number three, eight, maybe even all the way down to number five. Everything is is changed. Your whole world has just changed. Everything. Our focus, our priority is now on what? Living. Because you've just been told that you're going to die. You're going to die. And so everything changes. Paul, this is exactly what happens to Paul. This is exactly what happens to him. The transformation. Not not a physical death, but he got to a place. He experienced this kind of death in a spiritual way. He went from death, spiritual death, to spiritual life. Suddenly, in his decision, everything changes. The same thing will happen to and for you and I. (coughs) Excuse me. All right, where did we leave off? Verse... Lost my plate. Ten. Okay. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. Did you hear that? (laughs) So that one way or another, I will experience the resurrection of the dead. Hmm. What he's saying here, he says, I want to know Jesus. I don't just don't want to know about him. 
I want to know him. I want to dig deeper. I want to live daily for him. I want to walk and I want to talk with him. I want to experience his power. And, and I want his power to move through me. I want a taste of the Lord and see that he is good. I want to eat of him. I want to partake. I want to share in Christ. This right here is, is, is what we would call an intimate relationship with Christ. Now, many of us can have a casual relationship with Christ. And that would mean I go to church on Sunday or Wednesday and I participate. But when I go home, my focus and my life is in the direction of my family or my job. This is not what Paul's talking about here. No, 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 no. He's talking about, I want to talk to you, Jesus, more than I talk to people. You know, because we can have a lot of conversations with our friends. We can have a lot of conversations with our spouse. Who are we spending more time with? Is it the Lord? Or is it our friends, our spouse? Think about those things. How many of you talk to yourself? <laughs> How many of you answer yourself when you talk to yourself, right? Do you do it often? Do you do it a lot, right? I, I just thought of that this morning, and it was kind of funny. I giggled when I thought about that. We have an opportunity every day, as long as I have breath, as long as I have breath to breathe on this earth, we have an opportunity to get to know the Lord more and more and more and more. And the way that that happens is by spending time with him. That's how it happens. It's just like a natural relationship. Experience. He says, I want to experience the power, the power of Jesus. Another translation here says it's attain. Greek word, arrive. I want to get to that place. I want to get to that place where I'm in him all the time. All the time. Not some of the time. All of the time. I want to identify with Jesus I want to embrace Jesus to the fullest extent. Paul is saying here, I give you my all. I want, I want all of you in me. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be an example of Jesus to those around me. So just wow. Just wow. He sounds like a radical. But remember, before Christ, what was he? He was a radical. He was a radical. So when you get saved, you're still the same person as far as your personality, those kinds of things. So the same passion that he had was the same passion that drove him, but it was in the right direction. Amen? Who says these kinds of things like, um, he wants to suffer? Have you ever said that? <laughs> no, I, I've never said that. In fact, we pray for, for healing. We believe for healing. We don't say, Lord, I want to suffer in your suffering. Paul did. Paul was amazing. What I have to say about that is just wow. When, when, when I'm blown away, that's usually what I say. Just, wow, exclamation point, right? <laughs> Pressing towards the goal. Pressing towards the goal. We're going to go ahead and, and, and switch into part two. 
Verse 12, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things or that I have already reached perfection. What he knows is that there's only one that was perfect, and that was the one he received who could perfect him. Not that he would ever be perfect, but what he's talking about here and in the, these remaining uh, verses is perseverance. Perseverance, not perfection, but perseverance. So pressing towards the goal. Verse 12, he's talking about, yes, I'm going to fall short. I haven't arrived. He's being transparent right here. You know, it would, it would do us well at times, and all the time, actually, not at times. It would do us well to be transparent and, and let people know, you know, I missed it. I messed up. I haven't arrived. But my heart's desire is to do better, is to live well, is to love well, is to make the right choices, is to live, to live in Christ. And as I'm living in Christ then he's going to show me the way because he is my truth. He is the way maker. And so that is where I want to thrive, not strive, but to thrive. Verse 13. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what is ahead I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Jesus uh, Christ, is calling us. He says, I can't and I won't look back. I can't because if I do, I might get tripped up because something back there might be familiar to me. So let me not do that. But he says... Um, and if I, if I did, if I did, what would I be going back to compared to what I know and what I have now? There's no comparison. Ma'am, don't want to go back there. That's right, Miss Faye. No regrets. We can't see what's ahead if we go back or if we stay if we dwell on what's back there. Now, Paul is not saying that he doesn't remember his past, but he's now declaring and decreeing he's not defined anymore by his past. He is not letting his past dominate him anymore. I'm a new creature in Christ. He's saying goodbye to the past his lifestyle, and his choices. He has made a clear choice, a clear decision. I am a new man in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Old, remember that, script, that passage? Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Paul here has made an exchange for masters, Old God, new God. He's made an exchange for de from death to life. We, like Paul, run the race to finish. How many of you know in a natural race, none of us would, if we ran track in the natural and we trained for the race and, and it was the day of the race, and, and you know how they have some of those hurdles you've got to jump over? <laughs> All right, so we're, we're in that race, and, and, and maybe one of the hurdles fall. You know, we hit it with our foot when we're trying to jump over it. You wouldn't just stop right there. You know, we just wouldn't stop in the natural race. We would, we would press on. We would press on. We would continue because that runner sees that tape. He sees, he or she sees the finish line, and they're going to keep going. Pardon? The goal. Yes, they see the goal. Their eyes are fixed on the finish line. 
Amen? That's exactly, excuse me, that is exactly um, what Paul is talking about here. Us running the race in Christ. That he runs it with me. I don't run alone. (coughs) Excuse me. I don't run alone. Always with me. And when I actually hit, topple over the hurdle, he picks me up. And turns me around, sets my feet on solid ground, right? Yes, like the song says, amen. Verse 15, let all who are spiritually mature, not dwelling on the past, not stuck in the past, agree on these things. If you disagree... On some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Nothing is too big for our God. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Some of you today might say, well, Donna, I don't have the religious past that Paul had. That's not, a, that's not my resume. It's not my story. But I have other things. I have past hurts. I have disappointments. I have failures. I've got a lot of things. I've got a lot of ugliness in my past of decisions and choices that I made. Let me say 100, with 100% certainty... That God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit can handle anything and all of it. Just like he did for Paul. Just like he, he is no respecter of persons. He loves all people just the same. No matter what we've done, he's got it. God's, as pastor says, God's got this. So. I would encourage you today to take every bit of it, every area in your life, all of your list, mental list that you have as to why you struggle, as to why you're stuck, as to why, 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 why. What happened in your past was bad. All of those things. I'm not minimizing that they were real. They were real, and they were hurtful, and they were hard. But the same happened with Paul, even unto death. Remember his death? Oh, my. But God, I will say to you today, but God, there's nothing too hard for God. So we give it to the Lord, every bit of it. We say, Lord, I give this to you. Donna, it's just that simple. Yes. Yes, it is. We, Lord, I give this to you. I give every hurt, every failure, every disappointment, every sin, sin that I have participated in, all of it. I give it all to you. And Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and I ask you to live there into my life, and I ask you to take over my life. You become Lord. You become Savior. You become King. You become the leader. I become the follower. Amen? Everything changes. Now, let me say this. Let's bring a little bit of balance. Circumstances sometimes may not change. May not. But... You're not walking through it alone. He will bring answers. He will bring solutions. He will bring creative ideas to help you to walk through whatever it is you're walking through. Amen. Today, today in this life, there's a lot of things that we are facing today. Concerns, COVID, sicknesses, finances, a job loss relationship problems, fear, 
over what's going to happen in this nation. Elections. Uncertainty over the future. The impact that it's going to have on you and your, li your life, your family, generations to come. Because it's not just about us. Paul teaches us that. It's not just about us. So there's a lot of things going on, kind of like a whirlwind right now. A lot of things going on all at the same time. But I'm here to tell you, God's got it. God's in charge. He's in charge. He's in control. He knows the beginning from the end. He has a plan. He has a purpose for each of our lives. Each of our lives. I have a question this morning for you, and I'm going to finish this scripture, but I do have a question. Um, 17, dear brothers and sisters, pattern your lives after mine. He says, follow my example and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. You hear that? Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we are eagerly waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power uh, with which he will bring everything under his control. Amen and amen. Here's the question. Is heaven in your view or is it in your rear view mirror? Is it before you? Or is it not even, is it in the rear view mirror? You, 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 it's not even before you. Eternal life is a gift from God. It is a gift from God. Paul's salvation and transformation now causes him to move into pressing into with passion he still has the same passion, it's Paul, that now extends into compassion and care for the body of Christ because now he is demonstrating the character of God, the character of Christ. He's a new creature in Christ. So the character of God, the character of Jesus, the character of the Holy Spirit, it's no longer about Paul, but it's all about being in Christ, and yes, even unto death, which we know the end of Paul's story, it was unto death, right? Amen. I'll end with this. Um, this morning as I was driving here, the Lord reminded me, of a picture, in my, and I saw my little dog, Jansen. I had a sweet little Shih Tzu, uh, and his name was Jansen. Now, all of you that know me know that I don't have children, and so Jansen was a joy in my life. He was a sweet, uh, funny little dog, a lot of fun, had, had, had just a just a, a, an incredible little personality. And so uh, when it got time, and this is what the Lord reminded me of this morning. When it got time to the end of his life, I had to put him down because he was very, very sick. And this is what the Lord reminded he, this He gave me this picture because he wants you to see this picture. This is how serious God is about us fixing our eyes on him. When it came time for me to put him down, they asked me, do you want us to just take him? Because he was in my arms. Do you want us to just take him 
and then go ahead and um, continue from here. And I looked at them, and I said, oh, no, no, I have to hold him. I cannot let him go alone. And so I didn't. I held little Jansen in my arms. And this is the picture that the Holy Spirit wants you to get today. As I held, just as Jesus holds us very closely, and he's very near and dear, as, as I was holding my little dog, and his little head was here, that little dog never blinked his eyes for that period of time. The entire time, his eyes were fixed on me. And I do believe somehow, someway, that little dog knew he was on his way out. But in those moments, my eyes, the love that was in me, and the love and the loyalty that was in that little dog, no matter what was happening in that moment, he trusted me. No matter what. Even I felt like he knew he was on his way out. And that little dog had his eyes, not a blink, not a twitch. There were people in the room. There were many people in the room. And they were bawling. Because you know why? I was a mess. I was bawling. I lost it. I felt like my insides were out. That's, that was the effect that it had on me. But that's what was going on on the inside of me. But my eyes, these eyes, and his little eyes, were, we were fixed on one another. And there was such trust. There was such trust even on his way out. And he just peacefully went. He just peacefully went. The Lord is saying to us today, people, Keep your eyes fixed on me. Trust me, no matter what's going on around you, because I, God, Jesus, my son, my Holy Spirit, I've got you. I've got you, and my arms are wrapped around you. And you know what, Donna? And you know what, Faye? And you know what, Linda? You know what, Jorge? God's saying today, trust me in all things. Because if we are in him, and we are, Lord, we thank you for that. We are in Christ. That we can trust him like that. Just like my little dog trusted me. We can have that kind of trust and connection. That connection. Being in him. The Lord said clearly, I want them to see that picture today. I want you to get it. I want you to get it that that is who I am. I am the God who loves you. I don't leave you. I will never forsake you. I am as near to you as your perhaps your husband or your wife is to you. I'm closer than that. I'm closer than a friend, and indeed he is a friend, but I'm closer than that. God is like glue. He will stick to us like glue. Trust him. Trust him. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. Father, we thank you today. We thank you for the encouragement and the life of Paul. We thank you that his life was not in vain. His legacy lives on. He's an evangelist to the world. His example, his messages, his writings. Lord, cause us today, cause us today to turn to you if we don't know you and to completely sell out to you and to say goodbye to yesterday, say goodbye to our past, and invite you into our lives as Lord and Savior. And God, you will change everything, everything in us. And Lord, for those who are in Christ, Lord, help us to keep our eyes fixed on you 
And on the mark of the grand finale, the race that we are running, that race that we are running called Christianity, followers of Christ, called, Lord, I, wanna, I don't want to miss the mark. I want to make it. I want to I go to the finish line. I want to finish the race. So for those who are in Christ, Lord, even on to death, that we would serve you, walk with you, talk with you, live for you, be a good example. Help us, Holy Spirit. You are our helper. Help us. Help us to run the race because we cannot run it alone. So, Father, we are going to be careful today to give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor in Jesus' name that you got this. Amen. Amen. God bless, and we'll see you at 1030.